there. Um, so what is sky running and how does it differ from fell running? And I thought I would talk about how it differs from fell running because perhaps more of you have done some fell running and I suppose it fits in a bit better with uh, last week's talk from, from Dave. So we're going to cover the ways in which it differs from fell running in terms of the terrain, the role of navigation, the distance and profile of the, the routes, the sort of kit you might use, what races might look like, um, and fueling and hydration um, whilst sky running. So I'll start with um, terrain. Um, so the official definition, if you like, is kind of technical running or mountain running um, over 2,000 metres of altitude. Um, so straight away, you're like, oh, over 2,000 metres? Well, we don't even have any hills in the UK over 2,000 metres. So how does that work? Um, and then it says where where the climbing difficulty does not exceed, and it says grade two terrain and an incline over 30%. And that's just basically saying it can be pretty technical. It can be up to the point of almost climbing, um, but it's not into some sort of roped and self-protection type um, arena. So it's, it's, it's easier than climbing, but it definitely is going to involve some, some hands-on technicalities. The 2,000 metre thing, it's like, although we don't have 2,000 metre hills here in the UK, I think if you have a look at a lot of the UK sky races, I think um, we've got a lot of very steep terrain, very rough steep terrain, and we also kind of have quite a lot of technical ground on the routes that have been certified, if you like, by um, by the International Sky Running Federation. So we, sort of, if you like, we sort of compensate for that lack of altitude by making it really, um, really technically difficult. Um, the term sky running is like a trademark term, and it's quite a new phenomenon um, coined by the International Sky Running Federation, which was founded in 1992. But obviously, people have been running and scrambling and climbing and linking these things all together and sort of fusing them together um, for longer than that. Uh, but it's definitely um, a growth sport. So there's now um, 200 official races in the world and over 500,000 participants from 65 countries. So the thing you notice straight away there is the difference, I suppose, from fell running or one, one difference is it's an, an international sport rather than a, a British grassroots kind of sport. Um, so, you know, you might expect, um, so you can certainly go to sky races um, in different countries around the world and you'll definitely have an, an international field. Um, the terrain then um, that you encounter uh, on, on a sky race or if you're sky running is typically more technical um, by that. I mean, more hands on uh, than it is in fell running. That's not to say that there isn't a really technical terrain on fell races. Uh, definitely get really rough ground, really steep slopes, loose scree, like rocks and ridges. Um, but on the whole, it's more technical in that it could involve some scrambling anywhere between grade one um, and grade three or, slight, or moderate graded rock climbing um, on some of the more extreme routes, um, which you just wouldn't encounter um, on a fell race. So there's that aspect um, and that uh, terrain that you encounter, the, the scrambling could be traversing, it could be uh, ascending, it could be descending. So it, it can, you know, you can encounter that scrambling in different places. I would say in the main, you have kind of more ridge running um, and less in the way of, um, sort of undulating wet ground and definitely sort of boggy terrain. That's not to say you don't come across it, but it's just a bit less of that in general than you might encounter in some of the um, lower levels sort of fell races uh, in the UK anyway. Um, so, yeah, the other thing is that um, if you come to these really technical sections like scramble the hardest scrambling sections on a sky race they will largely be manned so they'll have staff um waiting there with uh, you know like qualified staff waiting there with ropes and harnesses and and sort of to help support you and coax you on i mean obviously you're not supposed to rely on anybody but they are there to to support you and to to give you some um some assistance should anything go wrong so just to give you a sense of that you're not literally kind of on your own at this point some some races will rope these sections and some races deliberately won't rope these sections so it's really quite varied um what you'll encounter on these on these sky races um a really big difference between sky running um and fell running is the role that navigation plays in what's on race day um in, as dave mentioned last week in fell running you have to self-navigate and you might even choose different routes um, as part of your course. Uh, in, in sky running, you have to stick exactly to the route um, that's 
that's set by the by the course um by the race organizers and those courses are fully marked so you obviously you wouldn't see that in a fell race and, and i don't know if you can see my wee mouse on the screen here but you can actually make out just like a tiny red flag in that photograph on the right hand side there it's like a tiny red flag on a little metal spike um, and the sky races are literally marked with these little flags about every 50 meters like all over the hill the entire length of the race and so it's some of the most well-marked routes uh, races that you'll you'll see um and you can't really miss them um the only thing i would say is that if it's really super claggy and you haven't got other people close to you uh, it is possible if they switch direction really quickly to be like oh where is the next one i would definitely see people overshoot um the last flag in the wrong direction or, or rejoin the route from, from a strange direction um, even when you're following flags so uh, it's definitely something just to be to be aware of even though it is a fully flagged route and um, you do still have to really concentrate on following those those wee flags um, so I guess the reason why um, navigation isn't a part of it is because I suppose it takes the emphasis to, in the direction of focusing purely on the running. So I suppose it increases the accessibility of these kinds of areas of the mountain to people perhaps with less experience um, of self-navigating in that you can do these races, you can follow the flags and not have to worry about where you're going. Um, and it means that you can concentrate purely on running. Um, whether that's your bag or not, I don't know, but it's a different a different style of racing um, to, to fell running in that regard. Um, however, one of my kind of major bugbears is that to say you don't need to navigate if you're a sky runner is clearly not true because although you don't have to navigate on race day uh, with a map and a compass, it's completely necessary to be able to navigate with a map and a compass for any training runs that you do, any recce of the route that you do where there's no staff there, where there's nobody on the crux sections watching you and there's nobody marking the course with a red flag. So you do need to be able to navigate. And even on race day, um, if you get injured or you have a nightmare, you need to, to, to retire mid-race at some point between checkpoints, for example, you still need to be able to navigate off the hill and it could be bad weather and you could need to come down a totally different way um, from the race route. So yeah, even if you don't have to follow, if, if you don't have to navigate with, to, in order to follow the route, you still have to have that skill set as a sky runner. And I think that's just a really important um, thing to, to clarify. Um, the other thing that's quite different is that you get um, given a GPS tracker, that's it, just on here, um, and it's taped onto your vest before you start racing um, so that you're tracked at all times and the race organisers will know where you are throughout the route. So that's kind of a safety feature and it's kind of nice to know that people know where you are in case you have an accident. Um, it also makes kind of live tracking of the event possible for uh, spectators and that kind of thing. Um, but also it is um, a requirement that you have a GPS enabled watch or you carry a phone and the race organisers will usually give you a GPS file of the race route and it's expected that you'll use GPS to navigate. So as opposed to fell running where sometimes you can use GPS but, but largely you can't and the navigation is part of the thing that you're, it's part of the sport itself, um, this is it's quite normal and it's expected and even required to a point that you you are using um a gps enabled device so that's something that's also uh, quite different but i should say that the race organizer even though a compass isn't on the kit list they will give you a map um, of the race route before you start so you'll always get a really good map um so distance and profile then the actual race routes themselves um most sky races are ultra distance events so most of them are over 42k um, and they usually have greater elevation than you would usually see in fell races um, and i know you get some some fell races with some pretty big climbs in them but you'll notice this is one um this is a like a profile that i've taken from the glencoe skyline race route and you can see that compared to sort of maybe running a horseshoe or something like that where or an, or a classic ridge line where you might go up onto a ridge and you run and you kind of lose and gain a bit of height along the way and then you come back down again these these races are kind of characterized if you like by huge climbs and drops and climbs and drops so you, the big climbs come again and again and again and i think that's something which is quite different um, and in total the um, ascent profile of these races can be really really big um, 
So if you exclude the VK races, which is the vertical kilometre, and, and don't worry about what that is just now, because I'll come on to that when um, I talk about types of races. But if you exclude that category, you can expect to run anywhere between 20 and 60K, and you can climb from about 2,300 metres to about 5,000 metres, um, depending on the race category. So as you head towards the, the longer end of these races, the ascent profile is really, really massive. Um, and the, the bottom one there is um, another profile from, that's the Lake Sky Ultra. And again, you can see it's up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So, you know, these big climbs, you know, you're climbing to the top of the hill and you're doing a few hills and you're coming right back down to, to the valley level and back up and back down. Um, and so there's a lot of accumulative height over these longer races. Um, kit then... Um, so just like with a fell race, you have your mandatory kit list. Um, and this is one that I took from the uh, Salomon Scotland, uh, Skyline Scotland race website. Um, it's fairly typical. So you need to have your fell shoes, a waterproof top with a hood, waterproof trousers. And again, you might expect to have that scrutinized, scrutineered in terms of um, um, sealed, um, you know what I mean? fully waterproof tape seams, that's what I was meaning to say, tape seams um, in your jacket and in your trousers. You might need to have, uh, you need to have a spare warm top, hat, gloves, survival bag, head torch, uh, a water bottle or um, some form of hydration system, uh, a whistle, the map, which as I mentioned, they've given you and sufficient food. So that's all the stuff that's on the kit list. Um, but it's worth mentioning that that's obviously for racing. So, you know, if you're going out on the hill and you're doing some big days similar to a sky race or you're doing a recce, something like that, you might find that you need to actually take more layers or, or something slightly different to, to what's on the, the mandatory kit list. Um, yeah, so we, we, had, we had polls in the poll at the start. Um, and I mentioned it because polls are really popular in sky running, um, a bit like they are in trail running or, or general ultra running scene. Um, but in sky running, you might be required to, to put those poles away for specific sections of the course. So you probably wouldn't be able to have poles out for any scrambling sections or technical running sections, because aside from the fact that you need to use both your hands um, to stay safe in order to, to move along, it's also important not to like stab other people in the face with poles while you're doing it. So um, yeah, you, even if you can have, even if you can have poles, you, you will have to definitely put them away for, for some of the race route. Um, on these more technical races, that's not true uh, necessarily of the less technical races. And as I mentioned before, um, you do need to have some kind of GPS watch or use your phone um, or have a phone, carry a phone, something like that. So, so yeah, that's the, the, the main kit, not dis dissimilar really from um, fell running in lots of ways, but the other thing that's quite different is obviously you see people wearing the vests as opposed to you don't really see people with bum bags. And I think that's because obviously you're carrying so much more kit. Um, you're carrying a lot more uh, layers and you're carrying a lot more food. And that's because in the main, you're traveling further and you're out on the hill for longer. So you have to, to be, um, I don't know, I was going to say a little bit more self-sufficient, but that's purely just because of the, the length of the, the route rather than any difference really between fell running and, and sky running. Um, so racing then... Um, there's quite a variety now of races out there um, that are sanctioned by the ISF. Um, and this is a list of some of them. So they've got the Skyrunner World Series and the National Series. So we have the Skyrunner um, UK and Ireland Series, which would be like doing a sky race um, in England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales to, to complete the series within a year. Um, uh, the Youth Scarring World Championships, World Championships, <clears throat> and then the Vertical World Circuit, which is skyscraper racing, which I don't think, we definitely don't have any of that in Scotland. Um, and I have to say, don't ask me any questions about skyscraper racing, because I definitely don't know anything about it. <laughs> um, but, but the races that we do have, the, the types of races that you, I guess, need to be familiar with if you um, were thinking about doing your first sky race would be these four categories. So you've got the Vertical Kilometre, um, which is kind of like it sounds. You you climb a kilometre, but obviously you don't climb it literally vertically because that would be madness. And um, you you so so for example with the with the the 
the one here as part of the Skyline Scotland weekend, you would climb 1,000 metres um, over the course of five kilometres and you climb a Monroe in the process of doing that and you actually finish the race by dipping your little diver on the summit of that mountain. So you, you finish your race at the top and then your descent is totally untimed and you can just walk down or you can hang around and watch some other races coming up um, or you can jog down, whatever, but it's not a timed component. So you're literally just going hell for leather from the start line straight up to the top. And it's not like a mass start that will start people in waves or every 30 seconds um, so that you're slightly spread out. And yeah, you're basically just racing to the top of the mountain. Um, and you'll see these vertical kilometer races in different countries around the world um then there's a the sky category which is like probably the biggest category in that it's um probably between 20 and 30 kilometers about two to three thousand meters of height gain and although you are running a ridge running and you're running some technical rocky terrain you're not really doing anything hands-on you're not really doing any graded scrambling and so largely these races aren't asking for prerequisites or anything like that um, and necessarily much previous experience so this is a really um really great way of, of starting out uh, sky running and seeing some fantastic places um, around the world and then you've got the um the ultra category and some of these races are as I mentioned before, really, really long, really, really big. Um, and they'll also largely involve graded scrambling as well. So it'll be fairly technical um, over, a, you know, over quite reasonable amounts of the route. So instead of having just a small bit, there'll be quite a lot of, of hands on terrain. Um, and then you've got the extreme category, which are races like, um, for example, the Glen Coast Skyline, where, you know, you could be doing some some really long scrambly sections over the course of the route um so for example on that particular one you climb curved ridge at the start which is um a sort of grade two three scramble and then um you have some really technical ridge running lots of climbs and descents uh, some loose some really good scree descent um and then once you've hit the valley floor you you climb up to the anahiga ridge and then you, you do another sort of six miles of on and off technical scrambling sort of grade two uh, all the way along so um yeah some fairly sustained uh, scrambling sections so yeah there's a bit of variety there going from sort of non-technical through to to really really technical and the distance obviously stacks up as well um fueling and uh, and hydration then is a little bit different from with fell running because um Again, the race, the routes are so long that you can't just kind of have a small amount of water in your bottle in your bum bag, or, or go without, or just grab a cup or something like that. You you really need to have um, enough with you to to, to last a, a lot, all of the day effectively. So um, you expect to carry your own food supplies and drink water from the rivers or streams, or carry your own water. Um, and although they might there might be feed stations um, on the route, and you can see there's one here marked on the Glen Coast skyline there's a couple marked here on the Lake Sky Ultra and um, they they are if they're not designed for you to just only eat there or to go there and just fill your vest up with food and run off and um, it's there really to sort of to top you up and, and allow you to sort of get refreshments and that kind of thing so there is a bit of an emphasis on carrying all your own stuff uh, to, to keep yourself going. Um, and so I suppose part of it as well is being a bit strategic, then looking at the race route and working out exactly where you would get water and what the quality of that water might be like um, before you head out on the hill and do and actually do your race. Uh, OK, training tips. So, gosh, there's a lot of things to say about how to train for sky running. So I've just picked a few of my favourites um, and things that may or may not be different from fell running. Some are a bit different. Some are similar to what Dave was saying last week. Um, the first is, as I mentioned, a lot of these events are ultra distance events. So for any any ultra distance event, I would always say to train with your, your kit and figure out what works for you and then train with it. Um, because you're carrying a lot of stuff for a long time, it really needs to work for you and it really needs to be comfortable. If you've got like an annoying seam or like a label that rubs a bit or something that chafes, then it's really going to do your head in um, by the end and probably make you pretty sore. Um, and anything, even just like a toggle that like makes an annoying noise, it'll just 
do, do your head in. So um, you get everything sort of slick, really, so that it all works really well for you and you know where everything is stored so you can access it really easily. And just really practice that and get used to sort of fine tuning that as part of your training so that on race day, that stuff is all just kind of a done deal, basically. Um, and then this is another, this is kind of one of my favorites. And Dave mentioned this last week, which is specificity. Um, and it applies as well to sky running. If you want to be able to run these really big days on really technical ground, then you have to go and run big days on technical ground. There's not really any way around it in terms of if you want to get really fluid at moving over that sort of ground and, and work those muscle groups in the right way, um, then, then I think that that's, you have to do a certain amount of that as part of your training. But it's worth saying, don't overdo it. Because if you just went out and did these big sky running days all the time in training for sky running, then you'd do too much um, and you'd be really increasing your um, injury risk. So I always think it's good, it's a good idea to um, uncouple your mileage base from the ascent that you're building so that you'll reduce the chance of injury. So you might push your mileage up gradually um, by doing some longer runs on more undulating trails and do some good big climbs. Um, but if you just do them together all the time, then there's a really good chance that you're just going to uh, wear yourself out. Um, and yeah, consider bouldering, indoor climbing or scrambling as a way of training for sky running. So that's really different for from trail, from trail running. Um, that helps you develop the sorts of climbing skills you need to read the rock, to react um, quickly. Uh, it helps you build upper body strength and core strength. And all of this will help give you confidence on more exposed terrain. If you, if you have issues with exposure, then practicing on that terrain and becoming more familiar with it is one of the only ways you can really uh, get better at it. Um, and it's really about being able to move over that technical ground in a really efficient way that's so we work with um la sportiva and we run these bouldering for sky runners workshops um and the the idea behind that is looking at ways to to build strength um in muscle groups that we don't typically use as in st as standard as runners um and also look at becoming more efficient and more fluid on the rock so that um those sections become, if you like, a rest, a, a way of uh, resting your legs for a bit or, or doing something slightly different um, so that when you hit the top of the climbing section, you're actually able to run again. If you just come at them, throw yourself at them um, with everything you've got and you're scrabbling and working really hard, then you might get up it really fast, but you'll you'll be absolutely knackered when you get to the top of it. So, yeah, it's doing it in a, in a, in a considered and, and efficient sort of way. And then the last thing is is walking, which is definitely one of my favourites. Um, yeah, if you've got a, a route that's got like five thousand metres of climbing in it, um, something like um, the Tromso skyline or something, then don't think that you're going to be walk you're going to be running uh, all of it because obviously you have to to walk a lot of these really steep climbs and then where you might run in a fell race on some of the some of the ridges and some of the flatter terrain some of the undulations a lot of that is technical so then you can't run that either um and so yeah there's there's big big sections of the race route where you, you have to walk um and so it's important to train your walking so i think that doing big days walking or just also building that walking into your training when you're out in the fells is really important because it is a different gait and it's a different way of using your muscles to running. So if you just ran trails all the time and never did any walking up steep hills, it would be quite a big shock for the body to suddenly go and do a big sky race. So yeah, don't forget to train your walking skills as well as running skills. Um, and then getting started. So this is a picture on the right hand side of one of our guides, Sarah, on the vertical kilometre in Kinloch Leven here, just over there, just down the road. Um, and vertical kilometre is a really good way to get started with sky running because it gives you like all the, I don't know, hype of sky racing, if that's what you want to call it, like the international vibe, the sort of commercial hype. And yeah, it's very different from the sort of grassroots feel that you have if you go to a, a foul race which might be like a community organized or club organized something like that um, these guy races are commercial operations they are sponsored they have international athletes maybe celebrity athletes and they have um a totally different kind of feel to them which a lot of people really don't like and a lot of people do like and if you do a vertical kilometer it's a good way to, to dip your toe and see if you if you like that style of racing because it's part of that 
uh, at race atmosphere and it's short race and you don't have there's usually no prerequisites like there would be for um some of these extreme category races or ultra distance races um so you can just sign up and have a crack at it and um you basically get up into the high mountains and you experience what it's like up there and you, and you see if it's if it's for you the one thing i would say is obviously racing as hard as you can up to a thousand meters is pretty different to the rest of the sky races so you know if you're if that's not your sort of thing then um maybe you would prefer to start with a sky category race um which is if you like to me to me anyway more typical of sky running so that's, that's your sort of ridge running and your sort of rocky terrain and your classic views and big climbs and all that kind of thing the sky race the, the vertical kilometer some people love it and some people hate it i have to say having tried it it's not my cup of tea particularly but it's an, it is a real experience and it's definitely one that you can do with with minimal um previous experience and gives you a flavor um but yeah these sky races i mean you could uh there's several of these now around the UK and there's lots and lots across Europe and the rest of the world. So loads of um, options for seeing different uh, fantastic mountain ranges. The other thing you can do is um, if you've got particular races in mind, maybe is join the participant groups for those races on social media, study their website, race information. Lots of them will produce reports um, and previous finishers will obviously have filmed themselves and made videos of them and you can glean a lot of kind of insider information from reading race reports and watching people's videos um, the only thing i would say is that for those people that film themselves with the gopro it really makes the ridges look ridiculously gnarly and don't let that freak you out we get a lot of people come through our, our courses here at girls on hills saying like i really want to do this race but then i watch this video and i never i just don't think i can do it now and then they get there and they're like oh it's fine um and that's because yeah it really accentuates the exposure um so usually it'll probably be not as bad as it looks in some of these uh, some of these gopro videos um but yeah looking at these for kind of insider information is is a good way forward give you a sense of what it's all about and the other thing again is something that dave mentioned last week but it's a bit different with the sky running and that that is sort of work your weaknesses for most people who are coming to sky running that that usually means navigation because if you're not in a sky race and you're actually just going up sky running for yourself then largely you're fell running so you, you do need to be able to navigate um, and scrambling for a lot of people scrambling is the is the part of their skill set which is um, you know, which is lacking or which is new for when they take up sky running. So being able to um, go, if you go to a graded scramble, for example, um, outside of a, a sky race, then knowing where it starts and where it goes and how to tell when you're on the route and when you're not on the route and how to move over that terrain is pretty new for most people if they've never tried it before. Um, and yeah, definitely something, it's really, it's a fantastic thing to do to be able to mix that kind of really steep ground um with with running um it's really fun and i definitely recommend having giving it a try so um those are some things that you can do to get started the other thing is to um join a course so i'm just going to have like a shameless plug here and say we do courses on sky running we run an introduction to sky running course and a sky running improver course and these are the women's some of our women's only courses but we also do one-to-one -one sky running days with men and women um looking at people's weaknesses introducing steeper more exposed terrain developing people's scrambling skills helping with training from uh bring bouldering into your training program and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we do these courses. Um, and if you're interested in hitting the hills around the Glencoe area, then give us a call. Um, the other thing we do is we run these guided reccees for um, Scottish sky races. And here are some pictures from uh, various, um, well, these mostly these are from actually from our women's only groups but our guided recce's are um open to both men and women and we run them on behalf of the race organizers and so that includes the ring of steel um the going coast skyline the ben nevis ultra and you can join a group and go and see these routes um for yourself and that means that you can check out those technical sections that freaked you out when you watch the gopro video and it also means that you can see what you've got in front of you you can kind of uh, gauge the size of the challenge if you like and that really helps inform people's race day strategy and helps inform as well their training so um doing a if you've 
if you've done it by jumping in the deep end, which is great, um, then doing a guided recce is a good way of um, preparing yourself for race day. So that's some ways that you can, uh, yeah, get involved in sky running. And I think that's the kind of whistle stop tour of sky running for me. And um, I think we're just gonna do some Q and A now as well. So I'm just gonna stop the share. That's and awesome. Thanks, Kerry. Do this there. Great. Yeah, we've got you back on the screen now. So we have had a few questions come in. And I wondered if I could ask you just quickly before you do yeah. the questions. With the graded scrambling, if it's one to four, is one difficult or is four difficult? Four, but it doesn't really go up to four. So, yeah, it's kind of like one, two, three, and then you're into rock climbing terrain, really. OK. Right. Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah I wasn't sure is, about that. Yeah, one is the easier end. Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay, so shall I go through some of these? Um, the first one, for a first time Sky Race, which one would you recommend? Um, I don't know, that's a hard one. I, I'm obviously going to recommend a British Sky Race. So I think doing something like, I think do two. Do do the Ring of Steel um, and also do the um, Scarfell Sky Race in the Lake District. I really like those. And... Um, they would be good ones to do because they they have quite a lot of exposed terrain and and lots of good scrambling and stuff on them. But they're well. In fact, the Ring of Steel does the race. Um, the Scarfell Sky Race is less so in terms of its the technicality of those scrambling sections. So I would think maybe do the Scarfell Sky Race with, and then do do the Ring of Steel, and that that's a great kind of grounding into into scrambling and mixing scrambling and running. Yeah. Right, next one. Will you be running another weekend with Nikki Spinks this year? This year. Yes, this year. Um, that would be the plan. I think, what year is it? <laughs> I'm not totally, I don't even know what day of the week it is. Um, yeah, so 2021, definitely. Um, we'll be doing that in the autumn. Um, yeah, COVID permitting, for sure. Um, can you describe a bit more? Diff oh, okay, different grades of technical. So we've done that one, grades one, two, three, four. Um, yeah, so it just goes pretty much from one, two to three. And then when you get in past three, you're really getting into um, easy graded uh, rock climbing and then sort of moderate, difficult. And it goes up into the British grading system for, for rock climbing. Um, can you recommend any beginner sky races? That would be good ones. Um, yeah, so any of the vertical kilometres and, as I mentioned, the Scarfell Sky Race is a good one. Um, I know people, so we've worked with people who have signed up to do the Ring of Steel who have never done any sky running before, and they've come out with us and done an introduction to sky running, and then they've gone off and done some training. They've come back and done a recce shot before the race, and then they've gone and done the race and finished it and been absolutely stoked with it. So you can definitely do that you can definitely jump in there having not done it before um and 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 prepare yourself properly for it and have a really good experience of it so yeah um most of the most if they're not vetted it means that you can take that approach to it if it's if it's going to be too much for you to take that approach then it would be a vetted race and they would require you to have done previous similar races or show examples of I don't know, climbing scrambling type experience uh, prior to that um I'm not so sure about that. Are there any short half marathon ones? Oh, um, I think those that I've mentioned are probably some of the shorter ones, um, actually, by distance. I did the Pinnacle Ridge Extreme last year, which is another Lake District one. Um, but that that's not that's not a beginner's one, but it's shorter. It's difficult. There's not really any, any super short ones. I would just suggest that... Um, have a look at the vertical kilometer and then you'll probably have to go a bit longer i think the ring of steel sky race is like 29k or something like that so um beyond that they're mostly longer um how common is it to see the majority of participants walk up hills or is this pretty much expected no it's absolutely totally expected everybody walks up the hills totally no i think you'd be mad if you didn't run up the hill if you ran up the hills frankly um having said that I did watch Killian Jornet pretty much run up every single hill when he came here. Um, and he did walk some sections, but I think uh, when he saw other people sort of even vaguely within sort of a mile, million miles of him, he just ran off. So I think, <laughs> I think it's a case of uh, there's only a few people who can really do that. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, absolutely walk me up hills. Uh, what would you recommend as a base level of fitness to enter a sky race? Um, good question. I would say I would say if you're running half marathons, if you can run a half marathon and you can build some proper hill legs, so do some hill walking and that kind of thing, you could do a sky race. Um, absolutely. I mean, you could probably do it on less in terms of distance, but I just think that it wouldn't it wouldn't be great fun, um, probably. So, you know, you want to, you're never going to run that long at any one given stretch. So, but that, I would say that's a good estimation of the sort of level of fitness you would need. Um, and then, yeah, definitely don't underestimate how much the ascent plays um, in terms of the, the, the difficulty of the, of the day. So, yeah, it's as much about building up some ascent in there, doing some hill walk and some hill running um, as part of the training, yeah. Is it safe to drink from rivers and streams? Um, any suggestions on doing this safely? Yeah, so we drink from rivers and streams all the time up here, but I realise that that's, it's quite different in Scotland to how it is in uh, some other, other upland areas in the UK. So you just have to be really mindful of, the, of how high up you are and what's around you. If you're in an area where there's no other settlements, there's not people and there's not livestock, then you can be pretty happy that if it's running water um, and it's high up on the hills, high up on the fells, it's reasonable quality. Um, I usually say to people that, you know, if if there's any kind of development or building or even a bothy that's kind of upstream, then you definitely don't want to be drinking downstream of that. Um, you don't know, obviously, what's been put in the water there. And you, and you wouldn't drink from stationary water, so like a tarn or um, a loch. You would just make sure that it's running water, unless you've got sterry tabs or a sterry pen or some other fancy way of doing it. Um, if you're just drinking it straight out, go as high as you can for water. Make sure it running water um and yeah it's just away from uh, and away from other people other away from other competitors and that kind of thing and just take it where it's clearly running is what i would say um do you use a watering filtering system in the bottle no again i just drink literally from from the streams and the burns around here but that's because uh, the water quality and the, the hills are you know pretty undeveloped in terms of human interventions um largely and yeah, it's pretty good quality water. So, but I think you have to be really careful if you're lower down, if you're in the peak or you know the Lake Districts, and there's there's livestock there, or there's been lots of people trafficking through. Um, you just have to be really cautious that that water's probably not, especially in really bu busy popular areas. Um, top training tips for someone who is who lives in a flat area area but has entered the Snowdon skyline in May. Good. Um, yeah, I would just say that you know doing lots of um, hill repeats and hill um structuring hill running into your normal running program so so that kind of stuff as well as um any hill walking that you can do even if it's just like a trip away weekend here a weekend there i know that's really hard at the moment so you can just do hill reps and that kind of thing on a small hill i know some people who've done some fantastic things by just finding a ridiculously small hill and running it like so many times it would drive you mad if you've got the determination for it it's amazing what you can do um and then um yeah i think if you're doing something scrambly and the snowden skyline is pretty scrambly you've got to do crew goch as well and um, then yeah getting a bit of experience on the in the bouldering wall just doing some sort of easy reps or some sort of high number of reps on some easy train cl up climbing up climbing down traversing that kind of thing um is also really helpful um for that and, and just doing as much on the uneven rough trails as you can keep your ankles and your proprioception good um, would be a good good way of approaching it. When you say fell or mountain shoes, how might these differ from a sturdy trail shoes or would that be the same thing? Um, I guess the main difference between a fell shoe and a trail shoe is um, a fell shoe would mostly have more tread, a bigger lugs or more grip than a trail shoe um, and a, a bit less in the way of um, cushioning and midsole and that kind of thing um and often they're a bit more racy so they're a bit lighter and a bit more um low profile and a little bit more precise so you get a little bit more feel on the terrain um whereas a sturdy trail shoe as you say um is taking more of the impact out of the ground but generally doesn't have as much in the way of grip so i think that the, the grip is probably the, the really fundamental difference 
I'm glad you mentioned the GoPro thing, GoPro thing, because seeing those videos is really off putting. And I'm sure most routes are not as bad in real life. That's totally true. Um, they do make it look a, a lot worse. I think the drones are better. If you look, look for drone footage, it's a bit more. I mean, even that's pretty. Makes it look pretty impressive uh, once it's from a distance. But um, yeah, it's definitely not as, as intimidating as the GoPro. Are there time limits on race days? Yeah, there are. Um, there are cutoffs as there would be in a in a kind of ultra distance race. Um, and I think they are, I guess they vary depending to different races and different race organizers. But I know, for example, with the Ring of Steel, there's a, a kind of, it's quite a comfortable cutoff to get to um, the, the, it's got a comfortable period of time before the cutoff. And then you have actually got nine hours to complete the full route. So it is quite a good beginner's race in that respect. Um, and I'm sure that's true as well as a lot of the other um non tech or less technical races because inevitably they're going to attract people who are trying these things for the first time um what's the best thing you can do to train if you're stuck in a city during lockdown yeah again you just you might have to you might have to find i don't know if every, anybody else has seen this but it was posted on uk h the other day a quite a funny little video of some guys from glasgow um talking about a skyscraper bagging or, or a multi-story building bagging and yeah just like climbing sets of stairs and, and reps on stairs and any small hills you can find and that kind of thing is, is good for building leg strength um and you know just keeping any kind of hill repeats and, and speed work that you can on top of your distance and just i mentioned before about uncoupling it you can taking that approach if you live in a city it would be would be a good one um for, for helping train um, and you can't get in the climbing walls at the moment. Um, so just working, uh, you know, making a good base of, of core strength would be really valuable um, at the moment. Whilst we're all locked down. Do you feel risk of injury is higher to competitive level? I could be in training, trail running, so injury is a concern that holds me back. No, I, d I don't think that it, risk of injury is necessarily any higher than it is in trail running. I think that, well, I can only speak from personal experience, but I would say that, for me, the most injuries that I've had have come from the repetitive overuse of the body, if you like, um, and so as, are as likely to occur from, from trail running as they would be from sky running. Certainly the distance element is, is worth considering, and if you're going to do ultra distance, I would say, as I would say to any ultra, ultra trail runner, that that brings with it um, you know, a certain increase in uh, risk of injury if you don't build up really carefully and really gradually. But it's not the terrain, I would say, um, that makes people, you know, w that would make you prone to, to any kind of injury. Um, you just have to make sure that you're prepared and, and doing it sensibly. And I, I don't think these races see high levels of, of injury at all. How do marshals manage inevitable bottlenecks on technical ridges, especially when also being used on race day by members of the public? Could there be longish waits? That's a really good question because that's actually something that's really evolved. So. The very first sort of Glencoe Skyline um, event in 2015, a lot of people did queue for quite a while um, for uh, Curved Ridge, for example. And, to, and so then they actually moved the start of the race to a different location. They moved it back from Glencoe to Kinloch Leven so that people had more time to spread out. Um, and now the bottlenecks, they do still exist at that particular part of the route, but they're less than they were. Um, on the Ring of Steel, the race numbers, the, people of pe the number of people competing has gone up. Uh, quite a bit in the last few years um, and so those bottlenecks got longer and so what they were going to introduce this year in 2020 but it never happened was a um, waves of start, starting waves so you you when you entered you specified which wave you would be in and that would really help spread out the participants um, and I have to say when I've done it and, and, and spectators and things I haven't seen cues on, the, on those technical ridges on the ring of steel and uh, when I did the Rick Glencoe Skyline, I definitely didn't experience any um, any bottlenecks on the Anarchy because by that point, you're quite far into the race and the staff that were working those ridges were really great actually at helping people move through. And I thought that was really well managed. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a major issue. I wonder if you can share any good beginner skyline routes to practice on the west of Scotland for when restrictions find the ease. Wow, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of really good ones. That's from Sophie. Um, I would say send me a message and I'll send you some because it de it depends, you know, where you want to run from. Really, there's an you know, it's limitless how many you can do because really, 
just and that's one of the things I love most about the, the fell running and sky running is just being able to link different hills and different ridges and different combinations and so it is fairly limitless there's a lot of good ones um and obviously i'm going to be biased and say there's loads of good ones in glencoe so it depends where you're based and where you want to run from so maybe um just drop me a, a direct message and I'll, I'll give you some uh some example ones you can go for um sky racing sounds just my thing but i get really cold when i'm scrambling in higher terrain does it get really cold um do you know one of the things I would say on that score is you see a lot of people carrying their mandatory kit around getting really cold. And I think the key thing is to actually wear your mandatory kit if you need to. Um, and it's funny, people people don't. And I know I've done it, so I'm not judging people because I've definitely done it. You basically are in like you've got your race face on and you're not really thinking about it. There's a, the adrenaline's going, you're not really feeling the cold, even though you actually are cold. And so it's more a question of like recognizing the conditions and being like, okay, this is cold. This probably is cold. I should put this stuff on. So, you know, for example, like when I last did the vertical kilometer, I actually I thought to myself, I never put my waterproof jacket on because I'm not going to stop in a vertical kilometer. But I did. I had to stop and put my waterproof jacket on because I knew it'd be too cold by the time I got to the top. And it was really, really cold that year, cold and windy. And, you know, you do, you just have to say, because in the long term, strategically, it's better to put the layers on. So I would say, you know, obviously it's colder, it's several degrees uh, colder at the top of a mountain than it is going to be at the car. So it's definitely going to, and with the wind chill and probably the, the damp, um, or hopefully not, but probably the rain as well, all of this contributes contributes to to getting some significant wind chill and getting cold and so yeah just having that kit with you and being ready to put it on is really important and if you're out running for yourself and not in a race then you can have you know just carry more kit find gloves that you can scramble in take multiple pairs of gloves when you're scrambling your hands get wet um, and then you might have a dry part of the day or later on in the route your hands are a cold and you can put another dry pair of gloves on or have a pair that are really dry, really warm and wet um you can also get really good gloves for that so you know just again finding the right kit that works for you um, and just making sure you put it on you know just be over cautious with it what advice would you offer to get over fear of heights i never got over it when i did parkour when i where i was advised to sit in high places and get used to it i found the adrenaline kicked in but the fear remained yeah, it's one of the difficult ones, actually. Lots of people ask, you know, can you help me with my fear of exposure, my fear of heights? And I, unfortunately, probably the only thing that starts to whittle away at that is just massive repeated exposure, but you, exposure to exposure. But you can't just do it a few times and, oh, that's better. You know, you probably have to do this stuff all the time uh, to make a, a small dent in it. And if it's something that you've that's innate for you, um, to an extent, I do think it is very hard to change. There are probably the biggest impact you can have on it is sort of psychological sort of um, strategies for kind of processing the risk and and making de and decision making, sort of boxing it away. And you know there are psychological approaches that you can take to try and manage it um, a bit better. But I've I've generally found it's quite difficult to you know, on a one-to-one on -one with somebody, for example, to really help them a lot with the exposure. You can help them with their, their, their movement technique, their confidence, and you can go through the um, decision-making process around risk, but it's really hard to change people's um, fear of, of heights and exposure. And I think all you can do is, is, if you have the opportunity, and let's face it, most people don't, to keep on, to keep on doing it and doing it as regularly as you can. Um, I don't know about sitting in really high places. <laughs> But I know that the more you run in exposed terrain, the more you get used to it. Um, but that's a that's a not very easy solution. I appreciate how different the training has to be from your average. How different the training has to be from your average. Um, <clears throat> I guess the biggest difference it depends what kind of race you're training for. How that, the question was how different the training has to be from your average trail <clears throat> or wee hills running. The, the biggest difference is just you want to start building up much more ascent over your week and increasing your mileage quite a lot more that's the main thing if you're already comfortable with scrambling and technical ground then you can um you can emphasize you can put in the emphasis there on, on the distance and, and the ascent you do have to really build that up quite a bit even though you'll be walking a lot of it you do still have to really build that up and so that that would probably be the main difference in training are there any prerequisites to the sky races? Just for, for some of the longer um, races and, and the extreme category races, they would say you have to have done so many similar mountain races or have done 
X number of scrambles in the last X number of years, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, quite often you do have to, and as some of the sky races abroad, um, they may say you have to have done specific races or um, they may give a list of races that you have to have done three of or four of or something like that. Um, yeah, to, to sort of demonstrate your capability there. Do you have any advice about poles or using poles for sky running? Um, yeah, so I would just say, so I, I, I use poles for when things get really long. I prefer not to use them when they're really, really technical. And um, I just don't like getting them out, put them away, get them out, put them away. So, yeah, I would use them for more ultra distance sort of trail running um, than for sky running sp particularly. But I know that people really differ on that. And some people find it helps massively um, on you know, on the well on the ascent um, and other people on the descent, people who struggle particularly with steep descents um, also find that really helps there. Um, I still feel <sighs> any advice specifically about it. I think... I suppose probably it's going to come back to finding the poles that work for you, training with them, making sure that they're easy to, to, to access, easy to stash, um, and that you've used them enough in training that you don't get um, blisters on your hands or elbow pain um, and everything kind of works for you with those. Um, I like a nice light pair um, for sky running because the races that I do are quite long. Um, but, yeah, I, tip, I, I don't actually really use them for – for, for te really technical sky races, but I use them probably more for just really big foul running days where I'm going to be a lot of climbing on non hands on type steep slopes, a lot of a lot of slogging. Uh, I use them, you use them for that for sure. And and in winter, they're massively great in winter where it's slippy and sloppy and miserable some of the time. And oh, it's a lifesaver having having poles with you for sure. How hard is it to enter the Glencoe skyline? I've done some scurrying races above 2,000 metres but have less experience with climbing. Um, I'm trying to think back now to the entry criteria. Have a look on the website. They are quite explicit about what, what's involved. I think it's something along the lines of two or three similar type races and um, two or three scrambles, graded scrambles, what, what you've done and when you did it, that kind of thing. It's actually not too bad. Um, you just have to demonstrate that you can move on that kind of train that you've done those sorts of races. So I think um, you say there you've got less experience with climbing. I think it's more scrambling you need to demonstrate for that one. So um, if you've done some graded scrambles, either with it says it asks you, I think, to specify if it's guided solo or with friends or something like that. And um, if you haven't, it's something that's quite easy to rectify. So you could could target that as something to do. Um, Oh, I don't know that there's a limit for the vertical kilometre. Maybe there is. There probably is. Um, but I just don't know, actually, off the top of my head what it is. But I wouldn't be overly worried about it. I think it's, it, you know, it's held up as a race that you can do with, without much experience. And um, I definitely wouldn't. I think you it would be perfectly fine to, well, I think most people are walking almost all of it. Um, you probably run along the road access the bottom part of the hill and then most people are walking but it's a bit like how fast can you walk up a steep hill um what poles do you recommend oh obviously harrier poles um yeah so um again i think it just comes down to using um what you just experimenting with different poles taking advice finding something that you know works for you um because everybody's really different when it comes to that um what shoes do you recommend on greasy Glencoe rock? Good question. Um, so I mostly run in Innovates and um, I find the old school non-graphene grip works really well for me on that kind of rock. Um, it's nice and sticky. And um, yeah, so I've, I've been running for a few years on um, the, in the X claws um, and what are well, now the ultra 260s um so i really like those um i find that a really good shoe what shoes should we wear you can get quite a lot of um sky running specific shoes but i would say um consider the fact that most sky races if you look globally they don't have the same kind of mountainous environment that we have which is typically quite a lot wetter and greasier as was just mentioned up there so um yeah, I, I would go for more grip if I was sky running in the UK than I would 
anywhere else probably i think you you can get away with more of a sort of um light trail shoe um or quite um something more typical to, to a trail shoe than a fell shoe um out with the uk but we do still have quite a lot of uh, grassy work terrain on our sky races um lindsay says hi kerry i'm signed up for the memores vk other than specificity, do you have any other top tips? I would class myself as a downhiller. So I've entered this to stretch my comfort zone and force myself to train harder on the uphills. Um, yeah, it's going to be things like hill reps. It's going to be lots of speed work. It's going to be um, go out and find some really steep hills and like properly practice power hiking hard as you can, full ball, that kind of thing. That's really good to do. Um, and and just don't think about it. <laughs> just don't think about it until it happens. And they've gone, it's gone beep and you have to start because, um, you know, it's like a, it is like a stuffer fest, but at least it's over quickly. And, um, and it is kind of fun actually finishing on the top and then watching everybody else come up. Um, so yeah, I think it's all that kind of, um, stuff in terms of, I mean, that specificity really for, for the VK. Um, do races have cut off times? Yes. That, um, they do have cutoff times, and I think they generally reflect the level of difficulty in terms of getting into the race. So, if if it's kind of entry level, it doesn't have prerequisites. They're usually reasonably generous cutoff times. You might see them getting tighter and tighter towards the the ultra and the extreme ends of the spectrum. But part of that as well is the safety aspect. You know, the race organisers need to make sure everybody's off the hill. You know, or at least on the on sort of not highly risky terrain by the time it's dark they have to be able to manage uh, the, the people that they've got at the back of the race in daylight hours um as best they can so you know it has to be and then they'll have obviously planned for that to happen in terms of when they start the race but yeah the cutoff times are in these really longer races are going to often be about safety um of the participants uh, we've had that one. What type of shoes do you recommend? Um, I live in the south of England, so no mountains. Would the coastal path work as a training playground? Oh, definitely. Um, I'm originally from Cornwall and know that the coast path, coastal path around there is super steep, as steeper often than bits we get around here, and it's just super hard to run along. So, yeah, reps on that kind of thing. Find the steepest sections you can. Find some of those awful steps that are like almost vertical and just try and run up and down them. Uh, that kind of thing, really great for training. Um, and just you can, you know, get a watch that has like um, – an altimeter and enables you to clock your, your ascent um, accumulation and just record how much you're doing and really try and build up some some uh, some meters uh, in your legs. Any advice for people who find downhill much scarier than uphill? Um, yes, most people do. I think get asked a lot of the time about how to improve downhill running, and I think um, the one the one thing that's good news i think when it comes to sky running is that if you're doing something that's longer or uh, that has a lot more um has bigger climbs throughout the race you have to be quite strategic about your um about your race day in terms of how you if you like spend your energy and i think that how you run downhill there isn't one way to run one best way to run downhill it depends um for one, it depends what kind of race you're in and how far into the race you're in and what the gradient is like and what the terrain is like. And for a lot of these ultra distance events, if you ran down that hill like a fell runner ran down the end of a fell race on a nice grassy bank, you'd never start the next hill at the end of the day. You can't run every hill the same way. Um, and so if you're descending as part of an ultra, and often this is the case in a sky race, you're actually looking to say, well, not what's the fastest form of descent, but which is the most efficient way? How am I going to reach the bottom without having absolutely trashed my quads so that I can do that again and again and again and again before I get to the finish line? So um, advice, I would say, if you're trying to um, to be a bit more efficient and maybe not freak yourself out too much on these longer races you can actually just by really reducing your stride to really small you you bring your center of gravity much closer to the body you're less likely to fall and stumble it's much less impact it's much less breaking um and it can be quite it can be quite smooth as well and uh, rather than any big overstriding and breaking and dodging you know lots and lots and lots of small sets like small deity steps and just work your way down really gently that's a nice efficient way to descend so that you can carry on running uh, the rest of your sky race so um you can have a go uh, maybe trying that 
uh, what kind of shoe is best for skirt eye races? Well, as I say, in the UK, I would say more grip, but cushion type trail shoes for the longer ultras. So you, in the UK, where we have some long sky races that are ultra distance and technical and have bogs, it's really hard. It's really hard to find the shoe that does all of that. Um, who inspires you in the running community? Um, gosh, lots of people. Um, I've, I've done a bit of running uh, in the last few years with Nikki Spinks. I think she's really inspiring. Um, she's just one of these people who just kind of cracks on and just keeps on going. And um, she's just so down to earth. I think uh, she's just a, a real inspiration, the things she's done and the things she's been through. And, yeah, very impressive uh, lady. Multi-story car parks. Do you have recommendations for types of shoes? sort of done that one uh innovates are amazing on the sticky stuff but on wet stone yeah so the reason i guess they're a bit more slippery on the wet stone or is partly the more lugs you have the less if you like surface contact you have with a smooth surface so these trail shoes that have smaller lugs you know you can have quite a lot of contact uh, in terms of friction so it's a trade-off if you have loads of grip on the wet stuff you're going to have a much less surface area um so you that's why i guess if the rock is dry you're going to need um to have uh, something um, a bit sticky, a bit flexible. And, and the inevitable thing that happens with flexible, sticky soles is they wear out. You, you kind of can't have it both ways. You can either have them quite stiff and quite rigid and not that grippy, um, and they last a really long time, or you can have them like really flexible and soft and rubbery, and they, they mold around things, and they grip nice if it's dry, but they will wear out because they've been gripping the rock. So I don't know. I, I'm not a massive – I find it slightly frustrating that when – I suppose when people want to have, you can't always have your cake and eat it, I guess is what I mean when it comes to shoes. I think I, I've started to think that if you really want that grip, then you have to appreciate that that's what grip is. It's 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 friction. And, and so it is going to happen. Uh, so I, I kind of accept a certain amount of turnover with my shoes. But um, but that's uh, that's not for everyone. Um Is it important to train both uphill and downhill? Yes, it is, actually. Um, you know, I think oh, it's inevitable if you go out and do these big runs that you're going to do up and downhill, but you hear more people training there uphill and in, doing hill reps and that kind of thing, but you can do downhill reps um, as well. And that's really important because the downhill is far more strenuous um, and actually will have contrib will contribute to a large part of the fatigue that you get. And if you overcook it on these descents and you're not um, – well trained and accustomed to that then you you will suffer more as a consequence of that on race day um what's your average mileage a week during training for a sky race do you have mm, i actually don't know it's quite difficult because i think i probably i'm probably guilty of doing more ascent than i do mileage um and i think for me i i, I think possibly that's a more important correlate for me um than yeah, than the number of miles that I do. So I, I think more in terms of the numbers of meters that I do. I might try to do, start out, build up towards maybe 4,000 meters in a week, um, but only start out with 1,000 and over the course of a you know six months, try and, and that's easier for me to say because I can get extra ascent through work. So it's not for, you know, that's not necessarily possible for people. But, you know, if you, if you look at building that, Sent up. Um, I think the mileage is in a way less important because you're not going to be running um, long, long stretches in these sky races. It's more um, how many hours you are on your feet. So just being out in the hills for many hours um, is is probably the best way of, tr of doing it. Are there overseas events you would recommend for beginners? I, th I think just looking at if you look at the um, the World Series for this year, you'll just see a list of all of these amazing classic sky races. And, um, and these ones might be hard to get into right enough for this year, but previous um, contenders in the, the World Championships for the last few years, um, you know, will be good examples of great races. And they're all really quite high profile races. One I'd really like to do um, and haven't yet done, but have tried to do enter for several years is the Dolomith Sky Run, which is the which is the kind of sky race in the Dolomites. Um, lots of great scree running um, and fantastic scenery. I, I would I would suggest having a crack at that one. 
my son is 15 years old and really enjoys trail running with me. Are there opportunities for the younger generation to get involved? Um, I did notice there there's the youth um, sky running championships there. And I, I actually have to say, I don't know. Um, I don't know much about it and I don't actually know whether or not there are age limits on these events, but I'm sure you'll find it on the website. Um, I would definitely suggest dropping some of the race organizers uh, an email and seeing what the rules are around that. Uh, what strength and conditioning exercises would you recommend to prevent injury? Um, as I mentioned, we, we do um, a sort of strength and conditioning program built around uh, bouldering, but another important bit um, that's um, don't, that's one not to overlook, if you like, is um, ankle strength and proprioception. Really important for running on mobile surfaces, so where rocks and um, scree and gravel and things are moving. Um, tussocks, the same thing. Every single time um, you put your foot down, you're using that sense of position of your ankle to stabilise it and to, to, to move into the next stride. So by working ankle strength and flexibility and proprioception and coordination, you can, um, can re that can be a really important uh, thing to do. So you can do a lot of these exercises with a wobble cushion and it's really cheap and easy. Um, if you just get a wobble cushion for about 10 quid and Google it, um, you can find all these exercises. Most of them will be listed as rehabilitation exercises that you can do for um, uh like strains and sprains, but they're just as important for strengthening the ankle if you don't get to run on really rough ground very much. Uh, do you know if there's any training in the northern Cairngorms? Oh, that is good for sky running practice. Yeah, I mean, just anywhere around the Cairngorms, just getting up these ridges um, and around the plateau there and just like any kind of fell running is great just building up you know um you say here for sky running practice you could get a scrambling guidebook and look for grade one scrambles um start really easy don't start with the harder stuff but start with the really easy stuff or go with somebody who knows um or uh, go with a guide to start with and find some routes um and just start linking them up summits and uh, mountains and ridges and yeah it's just there's definitely no shortage. Um, I think a really nice one would just be something like um, up Fiacle Ridge and round the, around the northern quarries and back round on a short little route. That would be a really nice thing you could do regularly if you can get up into Aviemore. Um, I've entered the Ring of Steel. Do you have any advice on training? Um, I would say and this is not a plug for me, you can do this with, on your own or with friends, but definitely recce the route because it's got a real it's got a real sting to it. And if you've seen it, you'll be like, oh. Um, so definitely have a, have a go around it um, or at least, you know, recce it in over a couple of days, uh, different bits of it or have it in your mind as to how it actually feels because um, it really affects how you, how, you, how you go out at the start on race day. How can you simulate downhill without access to steep trails? That's a hard one. How can you simulate downhill with access to steep, without access to steep trails? Yeah, I'm not sure about that one, Emily. It's about simulating downhill without access to trails. Um, I'll have to have a think about that one. Um, if you PM me, I can maybe come back to you on that because I can't think off the top of my head. It's a, it's a tricky one. Uh, no, I haven't raced in Ireland. I was meant to race in Ireland, and it all and it was the year of COVID. So no, coming back for that. Any advice for when taking water off the hills and what to watch out for? Um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, just watching out for buildings, other people, uh, bossies, <laughs> anything like that. Um, campsites, people wild <laughs> camping. Just don't take water downstream of any of these kinds of activities. Not when there's livestock around. Um, not too low down on the hill, that kind of stuff. Um, for those of us stuck in cities, can we have a wee peek out your window and see real hills? I wish it's pitch black. It's been pitch black. It gets darker about half past three. So, unfortunately, there's still a lot of light at the moment. But um, if you go over to the Girls on Hills Instagram feed, you'll get like brain rot from looking at all the photographs of our hills. So, um, yeah. Uh, so I think that's the last one, Kate. Yeah, wow. So many questions. Well done. Powering through. That was awesome, though. Really good questions. Oh, sorry if I've sort of skimmed oh, over a few there, but some good questions, yeah. No, spot on. And 
I, I love seeing your pictures on a, on social, all of the Glencoe pictures. So, yeah, definitely give um, Girls on Hills a follow on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, thanks so much, Kerry. That's awesome. No problem. Thanks for having me. Um, Hopefully I haven't contributed to the most depressing day of the year. Oh, I know. But um, I was going to say, last week, Dave gave people some homework. And I was wondering, what's a particular training session that you enjoy doing? Um, I know that you mentioned walking, so like with hiking and reps and things. Or is there anything um, specific that you think could be fun for people to have a go at whilst they're training for their uh, vertical kilometres that I know everyone's going to sign up for as soon as they can? Um, yeah, I would say, how about this one? Oh, this is a proprioception one. I would say um, have a go at standing on one foot and see how long you can stand on one foot before it gets really tragically wobbly. And then uh, and then try and do it um, with your eyes closed or um, catching and throwing a ball and and just see how much more um, how much more if you like wobbly you are and this is this is something that you can do um, initially without a wobble cushion but you can do more with with a wobble cushion um, to help look at um, improving the proprioception around your ankle for running on all this rough ground and it helps for fell running as well. Um, when you do these exercises like closing your eyes or doing something like throwing and catching a tennis ball, it takes away the um, the role of the peripheral vision, if you like, and makes it really hard to to do. And it's a really good way of, of um, training those those pathways for for running on steep and um, running on rough ground, running on loose ground. So yeah, just have, you can do it in front like five minutes um, in front of the TV or while you're doing your teeth or washing, you know, with the dishes or something like that. Just try and stand on one foot, um, see how it is, and then try and take away that that visual input as well okay yeah that should be good for a laugh so you stand on yeah. one leg and you throw yeah. in a tennis ball up and down <laughs> catching it with one hand see how many times you can do it you do that Don't fall over. no um i've got a wobble cushion i find them so much better than the boards because you yeah, can inflate better, them and yeah. deflate they're only about 10 or off amazon so yeah really yeah, cheap great. yeah but even if you don't run much on like rough trails even just doing it just on the floor on one foot is really you know, it's a good place to start and then build up towards a nice wobbly cushion. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been great. No, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, pass on our hellos to the rest of the team at Girls on Hills Will as well. Um, so yeah, you know, when hopefully restrictions um, improve and things, then yeah. you guys are going to have workshops, guided runs, um, race recce's, all those sorts of things. Um, and I've been out with you before. I loved it. It was such a great day. I've still got all of the pictures, so I'd highly recommend it. Good, yeah, and you'll have to come back up. Yes, I know. I can't wait. There's no hills here, so um, I'm going to have to go and find a little like a, a little slope tomorrow and, and get on it, I think, so I don't lose too much fitness. So I hope that's been a little bit of motivation for everybody um, with, you know, what's a little bit gloomy times at the moment but we can definitely still be doing something and we'll look forward to the spring when hopefully we can do a little bit more so um thanks Kerry we'll put this on YouTube so everybody can Great. watch it again and if anybody's got any other questions that pop up then you can send them direct over yeah, to just, Kerry just drop us an email. okay all right enjoy the rest Great. of your evening then everybody and see you soon